So let's kick off on this uh, very exciting community engagement session. Um, I'd like to uh, start by um, introducing Mark Martin. He's an assistant professor in computer science and education practice at the New College of the Humanities in London and co-founder of UK Black Tech. He's a thought leader in EdTech, sharing his expertise and insights to educators around the world. He advises major global tech brands and continues to advocate for homegrown talent, digital skills and, and education equity. In 2019, he was awarded an MBE for services to education, technology and diversity in UK technology. And earlier this year, he was recognised as one of the top 50 most influential people in UK IT. So I'd like to hand it over to Mark now. Thank you for having me. Let me just make sure my camera is working. Can you see me? Yes, I can, Mark. Awesome. So I'm going to share my screen. So today I want to explore digital community engagement. And thank you for the introduction. I've been working in education for the last 18 years now. And one of my um, first jobs in, um, in, in education was all about encouraging professionals to use online platforms. And over uh, the last decade, I've had the privilege of upskilling myself and working with a range of different big tech organizations, showing good practice of how I've kind of built these online communities at various stages in my career. And these kind of um, badges or um, awards have shown some of the kind of companies that I've worked with in terms of how do we make uh, an online experience relevant to the target audience that we're trying to serve? How do we impact uh, communities? How do we impact users or give people a voice or a space to be themselves? And one of the things that I always think about in education is the helicopter view, because I think if you're in institutions or if you're sometimes been in a place for a long time, it can very be like you're, you're in a fishbowl. But what does the ocean look like? What does the ecosystem look like for our young people or, or, the, or, the, or the target audience that we're trying to serve? And here's just a, a picture of um, thinking about the micro, meso, exo and macro systems. And when you're building online communities, do you think about the different layers of audiences or kind of... Um, or, or or stakeholders that the user needs to engage with. And one of the kind of things that's worked for me, especially in education, is around, we know that you know students have uh, churches, libraries, faith groups, after school clubs, parents they've got we've got policies that manage them they've got you know I, ideologies of culture attitudes and all of that and when we're thinking about our target audience do we drill in do we drill in and look at the different types of systems that they operate in so so as i was saying these are some of the the qualifications that i've i've been awarded in the past in terms of managing online systems and then when we think about the the different type of systems as i was saying before um, do we think about the different layers of, of engagement? And that's really helped me in terms of me really being able to see it from a 50,000 feet view in terms of how we're supposed to uh, impact the target audience. And then I went one step further in terms of, you know, a lot of the communities or people that we want to get online what if they're starting from a non-digital place? What if they're starting from a place of they don't have the equipment or they don't have the insight or they don't have the networks, they don't have uh, communities? And I put this image out probably about six years ago to try and help the education system think about how do we help people from becoming a consumer in tech to a, a creator? How do we help um, schools uh, from the basic model of being a school with not being no tech experts or nothing in there and how do we help them to connect connect them to the industry and then you know I, I kind of push the boundaries in terms of if I want my students to use an online platform or communities to use online platforms 
let me upskill the family. So I've done a family club for about five weeks, which was empowering parents to be able to navigate the online community as relevant as the students. And then I, I again, I went into the elderly community too, to feel that if I'm training up students to use these digital online platforms, could those students then transfer those skills to a different type of audience within our community? So we created this ecosystem and, you know, probably most of you are coming from different disciplines and different institutions. Do you have an ecosystem around the platforms that you're using? Or is it just that you put content on the platform and, you know, you do a few advertisements in different channels trying to get people in, but actually is there another layer of engagement? And then at the school, um, it's funny because <laughs> when I first was running uh, the online platform, it was called Fronter at the time for anyone working in education. It was a very clunky platform and, you know, students, the lack of engagement wasn't there. So again, creating this ecosystem around creating a like a, an award system. So we award um, students and teachers for engaging with the platforms and then with students, um, I trained them up and then they were able to train the trainer. So they were able to give that advice. But sometimes with online platforms, there's this perception thing where you probably have built something. And this is probably where user experience comes in and really drilling into your target audience. There's sometimes a, a misperception of like, what is it supposed to do? What is the why? What is the purpose? Is it purpose driven? Is it performance driven? Why are we building these online uh, platforms? Who are we trying to engage? Do we know the people that we're trying to engage? We probably have an idea and we have, you know, a, a tick list of who we want to, to involve. But sometimes what you find is that there's a mismatch. And sometimes that mismatch, again, can come back to this thing what I was saying before around having these, these different type of systems. Do we understand, you know, the global context to if you're going to build this kind of online platform? And now I'm going to move over to more of the work that I've, I've been doing with UK Black Tech and, you know, reaching a, a, a wider world global audience on these online platforms. Do we understand the, the historical view, um, a cultural view, a religious view, human view? Because sometimes what we do is that when we build these platforms, it could be siloed to the to the people that we either feel that would appreciate it or or we make some assumptions. And it's really, you know, really detriment if we're making assumptions of how we expect people to navigate our online sites and so forth. And then, you know, there, 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 is a, there is a need to get this right. If we don't get this right, then it can lead to misinformation, anti-establishment, distrust and popularism in the sense that no one's listening to the concerns. So we understand that, you know, if we don't get these online platforms to a certain point or, 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 to, or, or relevance to our target audience, there could be some potential backlash to it. And, you know, some of the solutions that we've done in the past, I'm going to share some in a minute around co-creation. So we try and find the stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders that don't have a voice on our online platforms or uh, when we're trying to engage? And one of the things that we had done um, in education, as I said, we, we kind of um, connected with parents. We make sure that parents were heavily involved in the process, but also we made sure that the community, whether it was um, silver surfers, whether it was just the public engaging too. And similar with UK Black Tech in the sense that we had to dive into our community to see what the real need is for uh, Black technologists using this platform. And then we thought, felt, thought, thought about representation, the language and tone. Sometimes the language and tone that we we put on these online platforms can be scary for some individuals, or it, it, it may prevent uh, present more issues if 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 it's not again going back to the previous slide if there's not a historical view if there's not a wider context are we looking at it from a global view a local view a regional view how are we looking at the context and if you're looking at it from a global view have you asked the people <laughs> who are part of that global market 
what they feel about the tool too. So there's so much different questions that we had to ask ourselves. And then the last thing around accessibility, which is sometimes an afterthought when we build these online platforms in terms of how are we making this um, uh, uh, relevant around, especially around neurodiversity and the range of different other complexities that people have when accessing platforms. So one of the things that we decided to do is look at the community needs and look at the identity of our platform like can people bring their identity to the platform will we be will they find acceptance within our community is our community engaging and relatable is there a sense of belonging that's what people want on these online platforms you know most on online platforms that do well there's a sense of belonging and people can bring their identity whether it's a funny picture or a picture of a cat or whatever it is of their profile but they 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 come in and we saw we we definitely saw that with some of these nft communities where they had all of these different images and you know they they rallied around these images and they supported each other they went into discord groups they had conferences there was really like this really sense of belonging because there was uh, some sort of commonality and then connections is the connection genuine that we're trying to make when we are thinking about uh, bringing people into this kind of online space. So UK Black Tech launched in 2017 and we was presented with some of these challenges in the sense that how do we support um, underrepresented uh, technologists within the tech sector? How can we create a space where individuals that historically might have felt that they didn't have a platform or their voices weren't heard, how do we give them a profile? And when I looked at the stats this morning, I thought I'd share them with you in terms of on our newsletter, we've got over a thousand followers, Twitter, 9,000, Instagram too, Meetup, LinkedIn, and so forth. And then when we looked at our makeup of our, our community, 60% of our community are women. So a lot of times when they say, hey, where's all the female technologists, especially, uh, you know, black female technologists, it seems that whatever we're doing, which I'm going to show you, that we are changing the narrative and we are showcasing that actually the talent is here, but sometimes it's about the access, it's about the opportunity, it's about the awareness. Do they know that these things exist? And then 60% working in tech for over three years and 35% under 25. And then, you know, this is the collective, um, the advisors on the team. So it's a range of us from all different types of uh, uh, expertise and, and so forth. And, the thing that I think made the difference for UK Black Tech when we launched, we've done a stock photos project and we put it on our website. And it's been downloaded hundreds of thousands of time because one of the things that our community said is that we just don't can't find pictures of ourselves to put in our pitch decks or in our presentations and so forth. And that kind this this stock photos built out our online community because we knew what the problem was and we quickly addressed it by doing a photo shoot in a tech office in uh, London, and then being able to share these photos. And we made sure that women were the leaders in, in the majority of photos. So they're still free on our, our platform and also on Unsplash, but we made sure we always we always position women as you know the the leaders the the you know the thought leaders and the visionaries because that's the perception that we we need to have when we're thinking about the future of technology and how we uh, uh promote and pop people up and then we we also started to put out articles in terms of you know there's so much technology in part of our community let's share their story let's share their experiences and let's share their intellectualism and one of the things that we've done with UK Black Tech is that we focused on the intellectualism quite heavily. Um, and again, for us, we felt that that's going to raise the bar when we're thinking about the next 50 to 100 years of technology. Um, yes, there are things to talk about in the DNI space, and I think there's quite a few other groups that do that well. But for us, we felt that actually, let's get you know the Black uh, underrepresented technologists talking about some of the challenges in today's world, raising the bar of that perception in the, in the fact is that they're not just contributors, they are innovators, they're changing the landscape, they're changing the narrative. And again, you know, that's one thing that's really grown our community over the last uh, couple of years. 
And then we put our report similar around, you know, how technology is improving the, um, how can technology improve the local high street? And again, the way we wrote this report is we embedded in DNI. So the report didn't involve DNI, but the people that wrote it came from all different types of uh, backgrounds. So our kind of approach to our online community is again, that sense of belonging is embedded. It's not just the thing where it stands out. It's, 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 it's kind of a flash pan thing or it's sticking out like a sore thumb. We want to normalize the experience, the online experience for our technologists so that anyone who comes to our platform actually sees that, yeah, I can be a part of this. I can see myself, you know, innovating and talking about the future of tech or in that relevant field. And then with our online community, we give them a space to introduce themselves so on your platforms, you give a space where people can, you know, share, share who they are. Um, we have a general section. We have career talks, news, cold resource, open sources and projects. And again, we, we try and populate this as much as we can. And we use Discord. Most people use Slack. Some people use other kind of online platforms. But we use Discord because that's the trendy thing. And probably that has probably improved my street cred amongst the young people who love it for gaming. Um, and then last but not least, just to summarize, I know I've, I've spoken for a little while here, but here are some of the takeaways that we found when we're building these online communities, especially in education and especially for, for, uh, for this technologist group, is around consistency. It's about finding whether you've got a team, it's about how can you be consistent in that process. Um, we've got an event on Monday where we're trying to support charities and organizations looking for technologists because that's one of the things is, is that some organizations say, well, Mark, how do you, you know, find people that can help us to drive consistent content so it reaches our ta target audience? That's a challenge, but it's about finding that talent. Uh, relevancy is the information and content on the platform. Can people see themselves in it? Is it relevant to them? Is it hitting some of the things that we've spoken about by giving them a global view of, 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 of current affairs? Is it engaging accessible user experience and different stakeholders? I can't stress that enough about how do we get different stakeholders who don't look and smell like us to be able to critique us on our platforms. Yes, we've had a lot of feedback in the past that has been challenging for us, but we've had to kind of listen to the uh, pain points and see where we can support them going forward. So I think I'll end there, and hopefully that's uh, uh, you know a foundation for a further discussion. That's marvelous. Thank you very much, Mark. That was a, a really wonderful overview of the you know some of the practical social issues that we should be uh, that we should be thinking about. Um, and uh, everybody, if, uh, if you could put questions for Mark and for Patrick in the Q&A, and we'll come back to those questions at the end. Um, Mark, if you'd like to switch your camera off for now, we'll, we'll bring you back in uh, after uh, Patrick's uh, part of the session. So I'd like to introduce uh, Patrick Towell now. Um, he is the Innovation Director of the Audience Agency, UK's leading organisation for sector intelligence and audience insight, for the arts, culture and heritage sector. He writes on innovation, design, enterprise and resilience. Within the UK, he's a financial and business advisor for Arts Council England, who co-led the development of the digital maturity framework underpinning the DCMS Arts Council England National Lottery Heritage Fund Digital Culture Compass. Internationally, he has had leadership roles in two national government information services and is a global policy research fellow at the Institute of Technology and Society, the think, the think tank for the Global South. I hand over to you, Mark. Uh, sorry, to you, Patrick. P apologies. No problem. It's nice to be confused with Mark. Um, and I'm going to try to share my screen. And hopefully that's going to behave. Let's just double check and I'll go full screen and hopefully that's visible is that working it is working Patrick brilliant um I'm sat in a moderately hot but not ridiculously hot um little office in an old cottage in Cornwall um which is near where I grew up it's not the house I grew up in but it's with friends uh, if the phone rings uh, excuse me it's not my house but I will <laughs> I will mute myself um 
and I'm wearing uh, not the right glasses uh, because I've um, uh, broken my other ones so that they're they're very cheap Amazon ones. I've got brown hair and a goatee and a and a stripy blue polo neck. Uh, so there you go. That's that's me. Um, and it's uh, wonderful to get the chance to um, share a bit uh, about this project. And I have to say, I'm uh, kind of standing on the shoulders of of giants here. So um, the director of consulting for the whole of the audience agency and our digital inclusion lead and one of our senior uh, evaluation consultants. So Penny, Liam and Nikki, this is is their work. Um, but I'm, hopefully I'm contextualizing it for you. Um, so this is unusual uh, funding. This is a kind of DCMS money via the Heritage Fund, the Digital Skills for Heritage programme. We had a, a luminary and helpful uh, steering group, and I, I, I would like to thank the National Archives, Film Archives UK, Historic England Heritage Trust Network, and um, Lara uh, Ratnaraja Art UK, British Library, and Archives and Records Association. This was uh, in, in, intersectional, as I'll go on to say, and interdisciplinary, this project. There is there is no simple answer, as I think we've heard from Mark, to uh, making participation in arts, culture and heritage work with digital. So we, we use many people's brains here. Um, but uh, why did we do a, a project of this kind around uh, de democratising archives using digital technology? Well, uh, it's part of our mission. So we're, we're there to support the arts, culture and heritage sectors. Our mission, if you look it up, is about enabling them to increase their reach and their impact and their own resilience as organisations um, and their relevance. Um, but also we have another part to our mission, which is to represent or give voice to um, audiences, or one might even just say people, um, uh, the public, uh, citizens, um, and indeed all the other people who aren't citizens who live in the UK and call it home. Um, and so this is one of the models that we have internally about a, a kind of range of, in a sense, perhaps the more on the left hand side, the more traditional idea of a, of a venue or a destination that's kind of managed by um, professional expert kind of people. Um, and, uh, and then as we go over to the right, we're more into uh, a range of being co-designed, co-delivered, co-created co with, um, with communities um, and users and audiences and visitors and customers, whatever we're calling them. And indeed, there may be a, a, a different combination of those things every every day. I, to be honest, on this model, we disagree about it internally. I think that there's a, another thing on the right hand side, which is where um, though, then it definitely it entirely starts with the community and in a way you kind of work um, leftwards towards having some arts and culture and heritage but that's perhaps a more anarchic view um so what this project was uh was uh um us managing a network of action research projects uh so we used all of our networks of um uh, all of the other things funded in the same tranche and all of our um, people that we work with, um, we, we running the audience finder service for Arts Council England, Arts Council Wales and Creative Scotland. We do have relationships with every regularly funded arts, culture and heritage organisation in the UK. Um, and then we reached out to more people and more people and more people. And so you'll see that it, in the end, uh, we we ended up with uh, a surprisingly large for 10 places, 76 applications, which was just amazing. And I think the thing that you'll see is that these were not the usual suspects. I will just see why. Um, so it, the, the kind of idea was um, to uh, engage genuinely new people who perhaps wouldn't um, uh, ever think of engaging with an archive. An archive wouldn't be a thing, they might not be the more culturally engaged um, in, in the sense of form, formal culture. Um, and so uh, it was great to have uh, an LGBT organisation, 
Um, and obviously there's there's uh, many different stories from different points of view to be told uh, for that community. Um, and then uh, uh, the, the Jewish Museum in, in London was, was looking at uh, kind of geo-referencing. And I think there was definitely kind of stories of place and journeys over time in that project. Um, we had the um, colonial history and uh, decolonialization, if I'm saying that word correctly, uh, issues um, are definitely within this project, although of course that wasn't only about that, but certainly as a kind of whose voice, whose archive, um, who controls the narrative. Um, uh, then um, we had, uh, um, um, Mark mentioned, um, well, m women and indeed uh, not men um, uh, from diverse backgrounds, uh, building uh, uh, um, uh, building and extending uh, archive. And so, uh, in fact, we had significant extensions to existing archives and some genuinely new archives built throughout this project. It was really exciting. Um, uh, there's um, some um, kind of really important history. Um, I, I remember doing a project on all the regional film archives of, of England. Um, uh, kind of when they were about to be annihilated by the simultaneous uh, abolition of the screen agencies and the UK Film Council. And it's it's interesting because the kind of national archive, the National Film Archive of the BFI, it tends to be quite a lot about film, but the regional stuff tends to be quite a lot about people and place. And it's a different kind of sense. The film is a is a is a recording medium. And of course, there's some technique um, things in still a moving image that is interesting in itself. Um, but in a way, it's it's about um, the people and places that you're that you're capturing. Um, so uh, we had a still image, we had moving image, um, we had quite a mixture of organisations, so some that were cultural, some that were local authorities, some that were um, uh, uh, community-led organisations, um, uh, some that were uh, media companies, it's, it's a real mixture. Um, for those of you who haven't seen uh, about Cinema Nation built uh, based in Merseyside, they're really interesting um, group. And so this was, uh, again, looking at technologies to, um, to create and interact with the uh, archive material. And I think it's interesting for those of you, us who wrestle with kind of collections management system and digital asset management systems, it, sometimes it feels like the interaction and participation um, bit is a, a, an afterthought to some of those um, products. Um, uh, this was something that was uh, addressing a certain uh, group of, of young people and looking at um, uh, gaming and understanding, conceiving gaming as, as culture, which I increasingly think that we need to do because it is part of many people's culture. Um, uh, uh, another thing that was looking at uh, women's experience from a feminist point of view, um, and that's a gallop, but I think we can see a, a of course, uh, well, I won't say of course, but we did have some some London-based things. But this is uh, quite a good ge geographical spread. It was an England England owned pro only project. Um, I don't know why we didn't have more um, from from the southwest, but in fact, we do do quite a lot of other projects that are quite um, uh, specific to the southwest. So uh, across the portfolio of all the different things that we do, we, we are more balanced than that. Um, and I promised. Uh, Karen, that I would share some of the findings. So apologies, this is a, a gallop and uh, we will share uh, the presentations, obviously, and also links to resources coming out of this. And um, so <clears throat> in summary, although it was 10 research projects, because they, they were often um, consortia and collaborations, partnerships, there was quite a wide range of organisations there um, and uh, quite a, a a large number given the, the, the kind of um, modest scale of what was being done and that limited time scale uh, of participants. Um, uh, the One of the kind of reflections was that it takes time to build trust and relationships. You know, there's a, a tendency to think that digital is instant and everything's very quick and whatever. 
Um, but this, <clears throat> the, the headline is about participation and de democratization, and and that's got a different rhythm and, and time scale to it. But so I think on reflection, perhaps uh, we would add perhaps three to six months onto the time scale. Um, but uh, one of the outcomes that we uh, wanted to have was that people uh, uh, both um, in the organizations and in the communities felt that they'd developed new skills, um, that these were kind of transferable, um, that, uh, and, and looking at the detail of the um, evaluation reports, this is everything from uh, really sophisticated 3D capture and also 3D information modeling, um, all the way through to people saying, that's the first time I've ever clicked on the mouse of a laptop. And so I, I, I just think that the, the breadth of skills here um, is, is really fascinating. And of, and of course, some, some of those skills are about archiving, are about online publishing, are about um, uh, kind of, uh, as it says at the bottom here, kind of digital service recipes, this idea of a kind of model of a particular framing of the way that you can build a, a digital service. Um, and so uh, there was an impact on, although the, the headline was digital, actually um, this impacted on a general approach to community engagement. You know, people are people and you might use digital or non-digital means to engage with them. Um, and, and in fact, I think uh, as we, our general conclusion is, is that there's a kind of blended approach that you you always need. Um, and, and I think probably all the people listening know this, but it's worth having it reinforced that creative activities in a sense of kind of animation of those things, but not necessarily by experts, um, either archive experts or subject matter experts, but just by people. And the digital tools can actually help people undertake creative activities uh, themselves. Um, and uh, there's an interplay here. So, so there's um, archiving and the, all of those uh, um, kind of information skills, indexing, cataloging, uh, record keeping, and, and also importantly, kind of the, the consent side of things. Um, and so both the community archives and the participants learned stuff around archiving and the, the kind of formal nature of that. Um, and uh, one of the themes, and it, I, again, it may seem obvious to us, but it's where, is this idea of preservation. And, and of course, no one has the silver bullet for digital preservation. Um, you know, I've been um, to lots of events by, you know, British Library and Microsoft and all, all the way down to um, smaller organizations. And, you know, no, none of us have the perfect answer. We're all scratching our heads, especially with kind of born digital um, content, but, but but that doesn't mean we mustn't try and solve that problem. Um, and um, there's a, a, a subject matter kind of outcomes of, of people for all that they may, you know, I'm LGBT, I, I think I know about LGBT activism, um, uh, but in fact, every time I read stuff, it's kind of like, oh, there's, there's a set of people or a set of key turning points in the history of UK rights that I, I didn't know about. You know, it was the 50th Pride this this year, and so I, I learned some more um, looking at, at archives, actually, um, strangely. Well, maybe that's not so strange. Um, but um, uh, there's an interplay here. So um, uh, many, many times the, the community archives and the community-led organisations actually had something to teach the formal archives. There was definitely an interchange. So, you know, the, the community ones could learn more about preservation and, and some of the uh, archiving techniques. But the, the, the way of allowing people to, to, um, to co-lead and co-create is something that the formal archives uh, took on so this idea of this peer learning group, the ten, um, the ten projects. It was just amazing, and you know, uh, both in the project uh, leads and and the participants, um, a, a very much more diverse set of people than we would see in a lot of um, uh, heritage projects. Um, and I'm almost to the end. You may be relieved to know um, the this um, systematic way of collecting information. Uh, the importance of preservation, uh, and then the, the more tricky things around the ethics of um, of uh, well everything to do with this: whose voice, whose story, 
Um, and if you're doing oral history work or you're including content from individuals, making sure that um, that uh, where that's come from and that their contribution is acknowledged and um, uh, that in a sense, the digital world is often about allowing a diversity of viewpoints to be represented. So doing that in a way that's that's fair but safe. Um, I think just reflecting for us, um, the, the projects responded and engaged. Um, they really appreciated the support and um, fairly informal way that we have. Um, and, uh, and mentoring and training, this kind of cohort of projects helping each other. Um, uh, there was quite a lot of communications and requests for information. Um, sometimes comes with that kind of funding, but uh, us trying to find a way to simplify it. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, we probably needed uh, to give them uh, maybe three to six months more to kind of have uh, uh, more impact and kind of build relationships. The question for us is kind of what's next, um, you know, uh, because it's, it's very clear that um, this uh, was something quite special, quite, quite exciting. Um, there's the whole uh, digital um, uh, divide. Uh, not everyone has equal access to uh, to digital technologies or equal confidence. Um, Recognising that a blended approach is is what's required, um, and uh, I think that's probably enough for now. That's great, Patrick. Thank you very much, and and thank you, uh, Mark. Um, if you could. Um, Put your camera back on again, Mark, and we can uh, have a Q&A session. I found both your talks absolutely fascinating. Uh, Mark, when you were talking about that idea of upskilling a whole ecosystem uh, around it, you know, families, the elderly, young uh, you know, youngsters and students and how they can help each other. And Patrick, when you were talking about all the diverse um, you know, communities and archives and projects that were coming together in your work, it really shows those those different communities uh, that are out there, and um, there was a question in chat that 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 reflects on this. Um, but I, I wanted to really uh, talk to you very uh, broadly about how do we attract those voices? How do how do we give them their voice? You know, you talked about mark representation, language, and tone, and some of the things that we put together. But at that time, how do we actually? really reach out and engage uh, with different you know different audiences and and really engage them for the, for the long term yeah so what we try and do is that we try and do it from a, we we sometimes we just do practical round tables before we even design something let's get a round table some outliers some people that we won't think about actually when we are building these online tools because sometimes this is the afterthought we get the techies in we got the vision, we've got the budget, we've got the funding, and then we think about all the other stuff that we want to include too. So what we try and do from the from the offset is, who are the voices that we need to be thinking about? Could we just set up a, a practical round table or whether it's a survey or, or reach out to them, go out into, the, into their spaces. Sometimes we want them to come to us, but why, why don't we just go out and reach to them and, 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 and see what they want and what their what their ambitions are and so forth and that's kind of some of the successes that we've had in the past patrick um i it, i think uh we were one step removed here so we were not ourselves uh doing the engagement i think that the diversity of the people running the projects and the, their organizations reflecting the communities that they engaged with was the key factor. And this has, I think, potentially quite big implications for the heritage workforce and, and indeed the wider arts culture workforce it, it's it's not representative of uk society um it, it it's trying to be but but it isn't and uh the the only way that you can have things differently framed is through a diversity of people um 
in control as well as participating. Great, and um, I have uh, uh, one very general question for, for both of you, but um, uh, but we'll be slightly putting both of you on the spot, so um, <laughs> <laughs> be prepared. Um, so, what do you think is the the biggest thing that you've learned in your in your respective projects? Were there any surprising revelations or discoveries uh, in these journeys? Sometimes you got to listen to people's grumbles, right? So we felt that by building this online platform, originally people are just going to come on it and just wine and dine and, you know, do all the things that I expected. And what we found is that the community just wanted one element of it. And we were like, no, but we spent all this time building 90% of this really shiny toy and, you know, uh, and so forth. And then we had to, you know, take it a step back and focus on that 10% what our community wanted. And what they wanted was, it's just more of a space to network <laughs> and to know each other. Because what, what they found is that their networks are so small in terms of who they can collaborate with, who they can partner with. And then, you know, on our platform now, we've got an innovation hub, we've set up a speakers bureau and so forth. So we had to listen to all of these kind of elements that our community wanted amongst our egos and sometimes our pride. Sometimes it's the ego, the pride, the working groups that kill the creativity when it comes to really thinking about, you know, how do we really serve these communities and, and so forth. Goodness, um, simple but hard questions. Um, I think that um, a mixture, a, a diversity of the diversity. I mean, uh, you know, uh, our geography uh, diversity wasn't so hot, I have to say, across England. But in terms of different communities, and communities who you're not seeing regularly in relation to collections and archives. I think that it was um, really uh, remarkable. And I think what's fascinating is how very different um, communities with different lived experience can nevertheless learn um, the kind of one step removed things from a particular community or particular subject matter about how to engage people with archives, how digital tools has a role in that, how um, you are mindful of people's digital challenges and barriers, um, how you want people to be able to express themselves creatively and their identity through what they're contributing and recognize that contribution. That's great. And I've got one round here, um, uh, which is about sustainability and uh, supporting communities in, in the long term. Um, there were a couple of questions that, that, that asked uh, similar, though slightly uh, different things. So in terms of the community archives projects that were funded as as one-time grants you know um is it where's the sustainability element in that will they be going on is, is is that going to be are those projects going to be carried on through community involvement or or did they understand that it was a sort of this was an ephemeral uh you know project that funded projects that that happened as we as we often find with, with archival uh funding but then also um, in terms of more generally supporting communities to carry on um, and to and to continue to engage in projects. So um, Patrick, if I could turn to you first and 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 then Mark. Yes. So um, that's there was a bound to what uh, we were able to do. Um, we we ourselves bid for money for the whole program, then um, quite a lot of that money we, we dispersed. Um, and it was emphatically um, money to do action research. However, um, 
I would say that it was very a little bit to the question also in the Q&A about skills. Um, it was about um, that action research was towards building capacity in those uh, organisations or consortia of organisations and communities um, to enable um, this stuff uh, to continue. Um, some of the projects that I do very, very deliberately look at enterprise, um, entrepreneurship, financial resilience, business models, all of those kinds of things. Um, couldn't do that in this. There was so much to do just in terms of digital technologies and new models of participation. Um, you could, you, you, we couldn't overload the project. So I, I agree that we did not have uh, some kind of explicit what's the ongoing sustainability of this as a strand. We, we didn't. Um, that's one of the questions that we ask ourselves and perhaps, you know, um, that funder and other funders of what, uh, how we can gra uh, generally um, uh, fund these kinds of projects and generally make these kinds of uh, archives and the organisations around them more sustainable. But I, I, I think it's definitely the case that the, that the organisations uh, taking part have more capacity to do what they want to do. Um, so that isn't going to uh, magically turn into money, but I, I think that uh, certainly it will embolden them to uh, to to bid for more money. Yeah, what what we found in the past is that especially when we want to keep these online uh, projects sustainable, yet there's a funding issue. Um, there's also um, an issue around how people fill out grants. So say like, for example, your smaller community that doesn't, is not used to uh, filling out grant forms. How do you do that? And then, you know, connect to the wider ecosystem. And then when we think about um, some of the problems, so one of the things that we've been working on recently is around uh, clean air. And, you know, there's so much that you can talk about clean air from, you know, the historical point, you could talk about the innovation point and so forth. And we felt that we just want to work with companies that want to support us in that momentum. So we've worked with uh, Dyson Foundation, we've worked with the GLA, and we worked with a few other organisations. But when it comes to that sustainability piece, what we've tried to do is actually align ourselves with other companies or tech companies that believe in the same vision too. But funding is funding is an issue. And my concern is that sometimes when that funding runs out, what is the life of that project or the stuff that you've been building with this online community? How do you preserve it if you haven't got the staff in or the resources? And and going to that idea of um, just to follow up on, on the project, this was specifically for, for, for Patrick, but of the 76 applications uh, where 10 projects came out of it, um, of the ones that, that didn't get through, were there pathways suggested for those that didn't make that cut about how they could be supported or you know, other ways that, that they could um, you know, uh, work with their communities or build their collections around their communities? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I... I, I'm pretty certain that we'll have suggested other funding sources. So um, the Heritage Fund itself has other uh, smaller grants programs um, and um, Arts Council England has um, project grants um, and also has kind of place-based um, grants. So it depends how ambitious people are being and how um, kind of unitarily uh, around uh, a small archive it is or how it might be part of a wider say potentially regeneration of a of an area something that's based within a building um, that has footfall from the community or or whatever um, so uh, I that there are those options um, and then as we're publishing the, the findings from uh, the reports 
uh, from the projects and and case studies of all um, all of them, um, then we will be back in contact with all of the applicants and and kind of go know that you didn't make it this time, but um, hope that you have. In in some cases, it may may be that they were inspired to, in a sense, do what they were planning to do anyway, but on a on a a, a kind of shoestring basis. Um, I, I want to kind of pick up on what Mark was saying, you know, I think in some cases with some subject matter and with some locations, there may be um, uh, companies, there may be local businesses who see it as part of their, um, their kind of community engagement CSR work to support this. So I think it's important for uh, people to not just look to, to public and sources. And I wanted to go on to the question of, of skills. Um, um, and uh, Patrick, the, the question that we had was, was uh, directed to you, but I think it, it's really to, to both of you in terms of for the work that you're doing, you know, either this project or the work that you're doing, uh, Mark, in, in Black Tech and your, and your other projects, how do you identify the skills to focus on? Um, you know, in terms of when you're working with uh, your, you know, the elderly community or upskilling families, or does it come from the communities themselves to a certain extent? Uh, is it a dialogue that you have um, with the black tech work? Is it is it you're bringing certain things that you that you think are core, but then there are other things coming into the conversation? Um, and uh, uh, just your thoughts on that. It's interesting, as a technologist, we don't teach uh, digital skills or technology so that everyone's going to become a programmer or coder or whatever. We actually teach it so you can understand the world around you even better than you had before. It's just like literacy or numeracy. And the way we pitch it, that means it's accessible for most people that want to enhance those skill sets and want to work with us to get to a certain place of opportunities or awareness of the opportunities that's in the tech uh, sector. And then, you know, the, the whole thing of also um, a, a lot of organizations struggle to find talent too. Um, how do we tackle that in terms of, you know, if we lack the skills internally, how, which, you know, how do we engage with other organizations? So, Again, we work with universities in terms of giving students work experience um, and, and so forth. So in terms of the skill economy, we try and look at both ends of the pendulum in terms of what does the community need? And then also what does we need as an organization? And is there any other kind of partners that we can tap into to enhance those skill sets? But um, I'll probably leave it on to Patrick. Probably might have a few more ideas around that. Right, well, I love what you said about literacy, Mark. So um, I'm trying to find the link and I will I will share it later. Um, the One by One project, which is a Culture 24 University of Leicester project, it's got a great um, kind of digital skills diagram and it's a, it's a triangle and I don't have it, so I'll describe it. So um, as you're looking at me, uh, bottom left is competencies. So, you know, can you program? Can you use that digital tool? Can you use TweetDeck? Can you um, put something into the collections management system? Whatever. Um, and uh, there's a tendency to focus on that um, in the cultural sector. There's a tendency to focus on, on that in education. And the, the trouble is, is that it changes very quickly. So the requirement for it Karen, you were asking about kind of where the requirements came from, or indeed um, uh, the question was, uh, was was about that. And th the trouble with those is that those aren't stable um, uh, requirements because the tools change continually all the time. So the next level up is, is you've got kind of digital capability, which is can you achieve a thing? It's functional. It's like that functional training you might do at the gym. Can you can you stand up and sit down? Can, can you? Um, can you lift something? And so the digital equivalent of that is, you know, can you promote a, an event using digital media, you know, and can you successfully do that? Can can you successfully get a set of people who uh, uh, haven't seen an archive before to engage with it? That's that's 
a kind of can you it can you do something that's an outcome that's not digital but with digital technology but the 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 third thing is is what mark was saying which is the 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 uh, the literacy which is what can you do and not do right now what's feasible uh, what should you do and shouldn't you do ethically or from a compliance point of view um, where there might there be risks where might there be opportunities um, what are um, some of the implications for inclusion exclusion um, what are some of the implications um, for um, uh, a kind of inappropriate speech being people being feeling unsafe um, and in a more positive framing what what are perhaps some of the new uh, forms of narrative that might come out of that um, that that's not about using tools nor functionally achieving a task it's a, it's a level above it's a kind of leadership um, change making um, it's 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 part of the the exo bit in in Mark's model. It's it's the wondering how this stuff changes the weather, and you can see that unfortunately both um, us as citizens and um, our political uh, class have been caught out because we have not thought about the impact of social media um, and these digital platforms enough and their, their, the impact on our society, democracy, um, the uh, quality uh, of debate um, that, that we have. Um, we haven't thought about it. We've been caught out. We're on the back foot. Um, so it's that literacy uh, and critical thinking are, are the most important skills of all. I do agree with you with that, on that. And I want to talk about stakeholders and the hidden groups and and mark you mentioned about who are the stakeholders who don't have a voice um and uh, so this is um uh, uh, this is a uh, two questions wrapped up in one um <laughs> i like doing that just so i can I, you can have a follow-on from it um so uh, in in the um question and answer it said who are the hardest groups or demographics to connect with uh, or put it another way does a smart use of resources mean that sometimes you just have to wait for people to be ready to engage? And I'd like you to reflect on that, but also possibly to reflect on um, what was said earlier about, you know, around the idea of that we can be siloed to particular or, or assumed groups when we create things, and how can we change behaviours to be more inclusive? Well, is, yeah, yeah, this is very interesting in the sense that um, how do we reach the, the, the what we found in the past is that you're not you can't please everybody on these online platforms um, and people will always have challenges or will challenge you on certain things. But I think for us, where we're in this age of, of misinformation, popularism and so forth. It's very, it's very, it's very important for us that whatever we're doing, we're transparent. We are, um, you know, we're clear in our messaging, and that you know, it's open source to a certain extent, where people can come in and challenge any ideas that we have. Now, in the past, what we found that seems to work is that when we do have that you know, open forum, the, the space to give, as, as I said before, we, we, we make sure that every event that we do, we have great representation from females and, you know, people from ethnic minorities. We make sure that, and also we, we position them as, you know, the, the, the thought leaders, the visionaries and so forth, people that can tell us about the next 10 to 20 years of the profession or, or, or the sector. And that's really important because, you know, if we if we don't have those stakeholders, what's the next 20 or 50 years going to look like when we look at all of our our collections, our archives and so forth? Are, they, are we just going to eradicate those people who never had a voice to challenge us and so forth? So those are the kind of things that keep us up at night in terms of are we listening? Are we actively listening? And, and that's one important thing in, in the sense of 
this space that we operate in. And um, who who is most difficult to engage with? Um, I I because I work at a research agency. I think I I don't want to to say without um, evidence, and I don't. I think my comment to it is that we don't have really good evidence. Um, I uh, we have the biggest cultural engagement data set in the UK because we have all the audience finder um, data, which isn't just ticketing, it's, it's also surveys. Um, and arguably is one of the biggest data sets of its kind in the world. But I even even I don't feel that um, we, we, we have a segmentation uh, of, of different um, behaviours around culture. But I, I think it's um, very dangerous territory to then split that via certain, say, ethnic groups or uh, linguistic groups or or whatever. Because I think quite often you find that the that the intensity of data that you would need to, uh, to have isn't isn't there. Um, and I think that's why you have to kind of have a a tailored, co-designed approach, project by by project. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think there's a, a global answer to that because partly about that diagram I had at the beginning, uh, there's a kind of interplay between um, who people are and what they engage with in their leisure and entertainment and, and, and spare time, generally what they regard as being culture um, and then what arts, culture and heritage sector and and professionals and institutions um bring to them and so that's the kind of relevance to discussion which um not to be too kind of theoretical or academic you know it's there are some theories of authorship of, of like whether who, who's in control it's it's a uh, mark mark talked about governance you know that there's there's definitely some things here about power who decides who prioritizes um, and uh, I don't know, but I suspect that we might have some surprises in some funding announcements that 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 come up because I think um, we may have may see quite a big shift of um, who's funded and uh, and why, and whether we agree with that or not. But certainly in in the larger funders. Um, there is a high degree of transparency about the requirements and the basis on which these decisions are made. I think it's interesting. I, I won't um, say uh, which uh, location, but um, you know, uh, some of the local authority uh, funding. Um, I think there isn't that same degree of transparency, and there's always a fear that perhaps there is some politics with a small p or perhaps even a big p some lobbying and other kind of local factors that um go into those decisions um transparency is uh, is the answer to a lot of that and clear clear requirements <laughs> it's interesting because they used to say data and you know let's look at the data was the uh, gold but actually it's transparency is the new gold now right how clear people are with their intentions and then also you know is it is it purpose driven is it profit driven you know and and who are we really trying to serve at the end of the day is it our investors or the people that are like grants the kpis or is it actually the community so yeah these are really interesting questions that you present patrick 